hands. And that was based on a belief before 1600 that God and spirit infused the physical world. And so they had a mission statement. There were scientists before the 1600s, and this was their mission statement. To gain an understanding of the natural order so that we can live in harmony with it. And that was a nice, beautiful concept that by studying in nature, if we see how it all fits together and all the pieces fit together, then maybe we would be able to fit together better in that picture and survive in, in a much better way than we were doing it. So science's effort was to understand the mechanisms of the universe in regard to the spiritual nature of it. However, around 1600 is when the modern scientific revolution occurred. People like Descartes, people like Isaac Newton got involved and they looked at the universe and said, you know, I, I, there might be a God out there, but we don't need God to explain this because it works like a clockwork mechanism. And that's where Newton got involved and he, with his mathematics was able to map out the movements of the planets and the sun. And obviously then he said, look, it's a machine. I can predict everything about it. Well, that then relate to biology because when we got to biology, we began to look at the body not from an outside spiritual influence, but we started to look inside the body because we said the body is a machine and it's just like the universe. And if we understand the machine, we can fix and adjust the machine. So science took a different approach. Rather than trying to live in harmony with life, this is the mission statement that current modern science is involved with, to obtain knowledge that can be used to dominate and control nature. The point is, at least at the, at the good concept of it is, well, if you got here and you had something defective or you were unhealthy or you were getting disease, then if we could control your body, we can control your health and the disease, and therefore we could provide you with health. So basically, you have to dominate and control nature to do this. So the issue is, I mean, first of all, just think of that silly nature that humans are going to control nature. Well, I mean, we always think big, and obviously that's one of the thoughts. And the reality is then what to control nature is we have to look at the human cell. Here's an important part that I learned from my research on cells and what I used to teach medical students. And that's a very interesting point. You are made out of anywhere from 50 to 70 trillion cells in your body. You're actually a community of cells. I used to clone people's cells, take them out and put them in a culture dish. And sometimes, in fact, many times the cells grew better in the culture dish than they grew in the individual, meaning that the environment was altering the reflection of the cells. Well, here's the point that I was teaching, and it's an important point for you to understand. With all this magnificent machinery that we call the human body, there is no new function that's present in your human body that's not already present in every single cell. You have a digestive system, a respiratory system, an expiratory system, a nervous system. So does the cell. And the relevance of that is, is that by taking the cell apart, we hope to find the nervous system for the simple reason is this. In order to pursue the mission statement of science is what? To control? Well, then we have to look at the organ that controls, and that is the brain and the nervous system. Well, we study the human, but it gets too complex. That's why if we study the cell, it's a lot easier. And so most of the advances in medical science are actually work from studying individual cells because the function of the cell and the life of the cell is almost identical to us. But how do we understand how do we attack this problem? How do we go and investigate cells? Well, we use science. The science that we use is Newtonian mechanisms. Remember I said currently biology uses Newtonian mechanisms. Well, there are three aspects of Newtonian mechanisms that are very important. Number one, the belief in materialism. The fact is this, according to Newtonian mechanics, Everything that's worth studying is physical because they don't believe that anything else is out there besides the physical wor the world. The, it's just parts. So all that matters is matter. So in looking at a body, you look at the parts of the body. Number two, bodies are complex things. And uh, there's a way of understanding complex things because if you look back at the body, you say, how can something work? Look how complex it is. And the answer is, there's an approach in Newtonian mechanics called reductionism. And reductionism is this concept, that if something is complicated, you take it apart and you study the individual pieces, and when you study the pieces, you can assemble them in an order and then understand how they work, and therefore you understand how complex things work. The analogy that's often used is the analogy of a watch. If I found this watch and I didn't know how it worked, what would I do? And the answer is I would take it apart. And once I take it apart, I start to find that gear A turns gear B turns gear C. And then I start to create a flow chart. A goes to B goes to C to D, etc. And here's the point. If you bring me your watch and it's not working right, then what would I do? I would take it apart, look at all the parts, A, B, C, and D. And if there's a part that's not right or not working right, I can take that part out and replace it with a new part. Well, the relevance is this is your body. 
and we can take it apart and look at the pieces. And if your body's not working right, then what will we do? We'll take it apart and put new parts in. And if we put new parts in, then we can control the outcome, and that's called determinism. That's the third leg of the Newtonian philosophy. The fact is this, if I know how the parts work, then conceivably if I make new parts, I can put it into the machine and then I can control the machine by altering the parts. And so basically by determinism we mean that you come in sick and I say which part's wrong, I give you a drug, stick it in your body and all of a sudden you feel all, fed, all better again because we can predict the outcome through a process called determinism. And that leads us to this understanding. This is from Judy Olawson's book called Mother's Little Helpers. Uh, this, this picture here shows uh, the Valium bottle sitting right there, the proverbial mother's little helper. And the relevance about it is this. As you notice, every 15 minutes on television, there's ads from the drug companies. And not only are they telling you now that they can fix parts of you, arthritis, pains, and aches, but they also say, hey, you having a bad day? You're having a tough time? You got a little anxiety? We got pills for you. And the issue is very important here is because the whole aspect of medical research is based on the drive by the drug company. It's the drug company that profits from the research because then when we understand how things work, they make the parts and then you buy the parts. Except sometimes there's a lot of errors in that. And I'll give you a big one that's affecting the population right now. There was a study done in North Carolina and it revealed that more than 50% of the children taking Ritalin for attention deficit disorder don't have attention deficit disorder. I mean, in other words, we're over-prescribing the drugs. And the problem is it's not the drugs that are the answers to the issues and that we have to look for another answer. So we get out from this drug model. So I have to explain to you how cells work. And this is a beautiful part because it's not very complex. The complexity comes in the number of pieces. And the pieces that I'm going to talk about are the proteins, that you have approximately 100,000 protein parts that make up your body. And these are just like machine parts. And the reality is that these 100,000 parts work together and carry out the life functions. They don't look like the machines that we're used to. They have weird looking shapes to them. They look organic. Of course they're organic parts. They're amorphic looking. They don't look like sheet metal and screws and nuts and bolts. They look like things like this. Now, at the top of the picture in white is, a, is an AIDS virus. At the bottom of the picture in white is the surface of a human cell that the blue structure is a protein attached to the AIDS virus and the red structure is a protein that's on the surface of every one of your cells. And the idea is that the virus cannot attach to your cells unless the blue protein of the virus complements and plugs in like a lock and key to the red protein on your cell. Now when you look at this little bubbly looking protein, you might think, well that's just this little organic chewing gum kind of thing or something. But the truth is this, these are as accurate as machine parts as any human machines we've ever made. That the fact is that this same red protein is the very same on every one of your cells because if it wasn't, you wouldn't be able to be affected by the AIDS virus. So my point is for you to recognize that machines don't always look like the machines that we see, but they have an organic look to them. This is another organic machine. There you can see a helix, the orange, I mean, the yellow and the magenta is a DNA double helix. But in purple and blue and green and orange, that's a protein machine. Again, you look at it and you say, well, that's a machine? And the answer is yes. It actually screws down the length of the DNA, and at the front where the arrow is, it, that, that protein machine adds new pieces to the DNA to extend the length of the DNA. So my point again is, look at this, but recognize these organic things are actually machines. So here's a picture of a protein on the left and a picture of the protein on the right. It's the same protein. And the point about it is this. Underneath the structure of a protein is a backbone. The backbone gives the shape to the protein. Remember when we were young and you went into school and your teacher said, draw a person. What, what kind of person did you actually draw? A stick figure, right? With the backbone and the shape. That's what gave the shape. And then when you got older, you fleshed out the stick figure. Well, the point about it is this. The protein on the right is the stick figure, and the one on the left is the fleshed out version of the same thing. So there, underneath, there are these uh, backbones. So here's the, the interesting fact. There are 100,000 different proteins, and all proteins are the same in this regard. All proteins are like beaded strings. The beads are amino acids. So when you go to the health food store and you hear about amino acids, what are they? They're the building blocks of the beads. There are 20 different kinds of amino acids that make up the beads. So what is different between 100,000 different proteins? And the answer is this, the length of the chain and the sequence of the beads. The sequence of the beads give the shape. Well, you say, well, where can you get some shape out of this? Looks like spaghetti. There's no shape in this. 